All right. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending where y'all are at in uh, the world today. Thanks for uh, taking some time out of your day to hop on with us. Going to go over sources today. It's going to be our main topic. Um, talk about all the different types of sources we can connect to, uh, the integration types, and all the processes that we can run on those integrations. Um, just kick things off. My name's Justin. I'm the lead trainer here at FlexPoint. Uh, been with Inventory Source and FlexPoint for about the last five years, um, and have have seen everything grow. So really excited to be helping everyone out here and and going through this. Um, so let me share my screen. And then as we're going through this, if you have any questions, feel free to, to post them in the chat. I will uh, try to get to those at, at a good stopping point. Uh, so the plan for today's meeting is about the first half. We'll be you know, kind of going through different sections of these source items and the types of integrations here. And then the last half, we'll have an open QA, uh, whether it's revolving around um, sources in general or maybe even another aspect of FlexPoint. We can certainly take a look and, and try to help you out there. All right, so to get started, sources. Uh, essentially, what are sources, right? So they're essentially, uh, sources are a representation of fulfillment setters or sources of data within FlexPoint. So think, um, you know, an inventory feed that you're getting from a supplier that has product data, whether that's a file that's posted on an FTP that you're getting from them, if they're emailing that to you, um, it can also be, say, your own warehouse where you're storing and managing your own items. If we're able to ingest that product data feed in the FlexPoint, we can help manage that. Uh, but what it boils down to in, in FlexPoint of sources is essentially a source of data that we're in that we're pulling and importing into FlexPoint. And then we use that data to build out products in your catalog, make pricing decisions, and you know, uh, sync that data to your website. Um, on the sources, we can check pricing, quantity, uh, in or out of stock status of products. We're going to be importing all the product data, titles, descriptions, images, uh, option values, attributes, if those are available. Uh, we can even set up custom fields if there's other data that you want to manipulate or, or use for filtering inside of FlexPoint that maybe you don't want to expose on your website. Sources are also containers that hold the processes for sending POs to your suppliers or those fulfillment requests so they can actually fulfill those orders for you. Um, it's also the, the mechanism that allows us to import tracking information and allows us to uh, also get invoices as well. So if we look at my page here, I've got a few sources set up here in different ways. So going left to right again, we've got our source name, we can put in a, a source type there, and then we can assign a vendor to it. We'll get more in depth into the, the vendor side of things and the webinar coming later at the end of the month that goes over our reseller portal and our vendor portal. So definitely check that one out if you wanna uh, get more in depth on the vendor side. Uh, but essentially the vendor portal allows you to have your supplier log in and manage the inventory and orders directly within your FlexPoint system. But the main processes for sources is our get inventory primary. Um, so this is the main one that allows us to pull in all of the product data, pricing, um, images, descriptions, um, all those data points we're able to map in and use within FlexPoint. The send POs or fulfillment request, this is the process that sends the purchase order to the supplier or your warehouse if they're the one fulfilling it. Uh, and the get shipments is the process of us importing tracking information from that warehouse or that source supplier um, to import into FlexPoint and then update out to your website or sales channel. So for, for an integration to really work back and forth, the main three that you need to have set up would be get inventory primary, send PO and fulfillment request, and get shipments. Now we have some additional processes that we can run if your supplier provides invoices, um, whether that's via email or dropping it onto an FTP folder, um, we can import those invoices, which allows you to, to reconcile your costs and, and run a profitability report on those orders. 
Um, get PO and fulfillment request acknowledgements. This is useful if your uh, supplier or source, once you send them a PO, if they post a file back that says, yep, we received this, it's good to go. Essentially just an acknowledgement of them receiving the order. So we can set that up as well, where once we submit a, a purchase order to them, if they provide an acknowledgement back, we can read that. So that way you can view how that works in FlexPoint and see the acknowledgements and know, okay, this is great, they got the order. Um, that one's a little bit less used. A lot of suppliers don't um, offer that, but if they do, we're able to integrate to that and represent those acknowledgements uh, within the orders page on FlexPoint. Um, another one here is get inventory images. Uh, this is useful if your, your source stores images in a zip file or an FTP directory. And we'll, we'll touch base on this in a little bit on how to really use that. Uh, but it's a way that we're able to map in uh, essentially on the Git inventory primary where those images live on that FTP and associate, associate it via SKU between that image and the item. So that way we're able to import those images if they live on an external server somewhere um, and associate those with the proper items in FlexPoint. And get inventory secondary. This is really useful. Um, a lot of times our, our source suppliers will, will provide uh, multiple files, right? Then maybe they'll have one very large product data file that has all the rich data, attributes, titles, descriptions, um, option values, you know, all, the, all those good data points. And maybe that only gets updated once a day or, or once a week, depending on the supplier. And a lot of times they'll also provide a secondary file that's a lot lighter of a file. Maybe it just has SKU, UPC, uh, pricing, and quantity, which a lot of times gets updated a lot more often. So that way you're getting more quantity updates more frequently to prevent those out of stock orders. Um, so what we're able to do using these Git inventory primary and secondaries, is so we're able to set up the main product data file on the Git inventory primary. And then we can set the Git inventory secondary to look at that more frequent inventory and pricing file. That would allow us to run more frequent updates on that and then merge those price and quantity values with the data that we're getting on the, the Git inventory primary. So this would still be one single item uh, you know, per uh, line on the file that gets imported. And we're able to kind of merge those two different processes and get more frequent quantity updates without having to read that uh, full product data file every time. And then these last two here, send the counting purchase orders and send the counting invoices. Um, these are integrations to QuickBooks Online. If you're using that, we're able to send the uh, accounting information from purchase orders, or if we're getting invoices back from the supplier, we're able to send the accounting invoices over to QuickBooks to uh, uh, help you out with your, your financial reporting there. Uh, so let's dive into this a little bit more. So if we take a look at, at this source setup, or we'll go ahead and set up a new one here. So source type for creating a new source here. Uh, this is essentially just a label uh, to help you kind of visualize uh, the type of source that you're using. None of these have any effect on how we transmit data or have any effect on integrations. It's just a label to help you visualize what's going on and, and organize your sources within FlexPoint. So let's, let's pretend it's my new warehouse. So we'll name it my new warehouse. And then here's where you can assign a vendor. Uh, again, this is something that we'll, we'll go more in depth on um, our reseller and vendor portal webinar at the end of the month. Um, it's not required to set a vendor here, um, but you certainly can. And then a description field, you can put in you know, any information here. This is just an internal note for yourself. Um, you can put login credentials here if you'd like, or any notes about um, the source or anything important there that you might wanna quickly reference, you can fill out here in this description field. Uh, so once we create this, we'll click save new source. And I'll populate on our sources page here. And then what we'll do is click the gear icon to pop into our, our source information here. Um, so the basic info, 
you have your source name and your description, which you can modify it here wherever, you, whenever you'd like. You can also change the source type as well and just click update to handle that. And if we go to our integrations page, we can see the configurations for all the processes uh, that I just went through previously. And we have a, a location for address here. So this would come in handy for rate shopping when we're setting that up on the, the ordering side um, or doing location-based shipping rules. Um, so this is the address that would get used to do that calculation between the shipping address and your origin address, essentially is what this is, uh, to determine rate shopping or closest for proximity routing in our order routing uh, rules that we have. Then we have our purchase order and fulfillment request settings. Uh, we'll go more in depth into these on our order routing or our orders uh, webinar that's gonna be coming up as well. Um, so definitely register for that if you're interested in, in learning more about this. Uh, but essentially these are source specific strategies uh, for our purchase orders, how we'd name them or potential um, overrides for auto processing. And then setting up estimated shipping costs would be used for uh, cost-based order routing and same with estimated dropship fee. So you can set up here uh, to really fine tune uh, our order routing priorities based on, on the lowest cost rules. We also have a section for shipping methods here. Uh, so this will we'll get, again get into more depth on our, on our orders webinar that's coming up. Uh, but this is how you determine or where you input the available methods from the supplier. So you can map those to our policies. So that way, whenever an order comes in and it generates a purchase order for this source, we know which method we need to actually send to the source for fulfillment. There's some cool settings here that, that get useful for, for fine tuning certain uh, values and workflows that happen within FlexPoint, depending on the type of source and the products that you're selling. Um, the first one here, we have may contain firearms. Um, so this is something that we can trigger if you are selling firearms or items that require a FFL, uh, which is a license uh, information that's required for transmitting firearms between two different dealers. Uh, so what, when you turn this on, it creates a workflow. So that way you can set up rules to identify those items that would require an FFL. Uh, so a lot of times you can do that by category, whether it's a firearms category uh, or, or however you, you'd like to break that down to determine which products in your feed requires FFL information to be collected. And commit stock. This is definitely a, a very useful one, um, especially when you're dealing with your own warehouse or, or suppliers that may fit into this kind of scenario that works out. But what this does is if you turn on committed stock, whenever we receive an order for an item and we generate a purchase order for it, which when we generate a purchase order is when we determine which source is, is gonna be responsible for fulfilling that order or that item on the order. When we turn on commit stock, when that PO is generated and we identify the source, we're going to decrement that ordered quantity uh, from the total quantity available from that source. So if we, when we generate the purchase order for that item and the supplier has, or the source has 100 in stock and the order was for two items, we're automatically going to decrement two from the total quantity. So it'll show as 98. Um, so that way you're potentially not updating back to the full quantity on your website until you either receive a shipment for that item um, or you receive a shipment and the source updates a quantity. Um, that's really useful for if you maybe have a, your warehouse maybe a little bit slower or maybe you're doing some custom build items that your warehouse takes a little bit time to uh, put together and ship out. That way you're showing uh, the total available quantity minus any orders that are still in that, that processing state. Um, and then you have an option here to when committed stock would be released. Um, so say you do have an order for those two items and uh, you have this first 
option checked. So after an update in quantity and shipments import. Um, so for that committed stock to be released and go back to the, the true quantity that we're seeing from the supplier, we would need to have a shipment import for that order or receive an update or and receive an update in quantity for that item. Um, or you can simply do um, after shipments import. So we don't need necessarily need to see a change in quantity from the source, but whenever we receive a shipment from the source, that would release that, that committed stock. Um, from that decrement. Any questions so far? You know, feel free to, to post anything in the, the Q&A chat if you have any questions or you want me to review anything more in depth there. Their next uh, setting here is rate shopping. Um, so turning this on allows you to enable rate shopping for this item. Um, we'll likely have a, uh, a webinar coming up just to fully go in depth on rate shopping because there are a few other um, stipulations that you'll need to set up before this to, to use that. So we'll have a rate shopping webinar coming up soon that dives more in depth on this. And then these vendor portal options, uh, again, this will be at the webinar at the end of the month. We'll go into these more in depth, but these just control how your vendors are able to interact with the, the data that's associated with this source. So these are the main general settings here. So let's take a look at, at the first uh, main process for a source, which is gonna be the get inventory primary. So we'll quick start creating integrations. Now, the first decision we need to, to make here is how are we connecting to that source? Um, so we have a bunch of pre-built connections here, such as Shopify, ShipStation, um, inventory source, Trade Gecko, SKU Vault, and so on. Um, so depending on how or where we're storing that source data, um, even if it's a Shopify store or a big commerce store, we're able to connect into that, that store and pull in that product data and, and treat it as a source. Um, this is really useful if you're using maybe a, a smaller supplier or uh, a smaller source of data that maybe they don't have an automated inventory feed that we're able to connect into, uh, but we're able to connect directly into their Shopify store. You would just need them to, to create a private app on those stores, which generates some API keys that would be uh, specific to use. So that way we're able to pull in that data. And then we're also able to submit orders back directly into uh, one of those channels as well. The main ones you'll see though are, is, is gonna be a CSV or XLS file integration. Most sources and suppliers uh, stick with the tried and true CSV on an FTP. Um, so what we're able to do there, if we choose that, that connection type, we'll need to actually create the type of connection we're doing. So if we look at a new connection here, uh, we can read the inventory file from an email. Um, so if we choose that, we can actually connect into um, your Gmail-based Gmail and import that file directly. Um, if necessary, we can also create a FlexPoint email uh, to use and we'll provide you that information so that way you can have your your sources email that direct email that's an option as well uh, we also have an ftp which again that's the tried and true you get the ftp username host um, the port which is typically 21 or 22 uh, we'll able be able to connect to that and grab that file from the ftp um, also an HTTP link, a lot of times uh, they'll provide a static link that whenever you click that link, it gets us the most recently updated file. Um, so you can use that. We can also pass header values and names or username and password if we need to in that connection. Another option is just a manual file upload. Um, so if there's just a file that you or a team member is manually updating on your, your desktop somewhere, and they're kind of doing it all by hand, we would be able to use this connection and then daily or however often that, that person or that staff member is needing to update that file in FlexPoint, they would have to log in and manually upload it in FlexPoint. Uh, that's, that's useful as well, because a lot of folks are still kind of doing this manually. And then on that kind of same notion, we can also read it from a Google Sheets file. So if this lives on Google Sheets anywhere, we'll be able to read that file and import that data as, as a source connection. So I'm just gonna use one of our, our pre, one of my pre-built FTP connections here um, that I have set up so we can move on to the next step. 
Uh, someone just asked a question. Are you able to also create products based on this same Shopify integration? Um, I believe, yeah. yeah. So uh, if I'm following this correctly, yes, we would be able to import that product data and it would show if we're using Shopify as a source. Um, so if I pop out of this page really quick and look at source inventory, once you create that connection and import products, those would show as products here within your source inventory. And you would be able to build these products from source inventory to product catalog, then the channel listings, and then publish that, that product to your sales channel. Um, I believe the answer is your question. If not, just shoot a quick follow-up. Perfect. So if we go back to our new warehouse integration, go back to our Git inventory primary. So we'll do a CSV over FTP. So that's step one in the connection. And then step two is our configuration settings. So the first one is the remote file name pattern is what is the name of that file? So we need to know when we log into that FTP server, what, what's the file name we're looking for? Um, so a lot of times you might have, you know, a products.csv or something like that, or maybe they do products and they hyphenate it with the date and time. The problem with that is if they're continually updating the file with a new date and we just set this, this date here, we're going to keep reading that old file, right? Because we don't know the new new pattern. So if that's the case, what we can actually do is instead of putting the full file name in here, uh, we can use asterisk as a wild card. So if it's going to be, you know, products, today's date, and a timestamp, and it's going to continually update that way, instead of putting in, you know, hard-coded value for the name, we can put products and an asterisk, where essentially it's going to look for the most recent file that starts with products and ignore anything after that to due to the asterisk. So that way we're able to read a file, even though it might have a varying file name, depending on when they update it, we'll still be able to read that file with that wild card. And then the inbound remote file folder, uh, that's just a fancy name for the directory on where the file lives on the FTP. So if you're using FileZilla or another popular FTP client to view that, um, there's typically a directory string whenever you navigate to the file. And it's as simple as just copying that and pasting it here. A lot of times it may look like something like this and a products and then inventory directory. Um, so wherever you navigate to, that's what you're going to put in for the remote uh, file folder name there. And then file format. Uh, so we can uh, import CSV files, TSV files, and XLSX files. Um, sometimes it, it may not be a true comma separated CSV. Um, if that's the case, we do have some options down below, uh, whether it's pipe delimited or semicolon delimited. Uh, so if we choose CSV here, um, we can then modify the delimiter um, in this advanced settings down below. But before we get there, uh, the next question is asking if the file has headers or not. Uh, most, a lot of times there is headers on the file, uh, you know, denoting what each column value is. Sometimes they don't. A lot of times they just have the information in there and they provide you a separate file that tells you what each column stands for. Uh, so the, the determination here has to do with the mapping template that we'll create later on. So if a file doesn't have headers, the mapping template is going to have you go off of column index position. Um, so one, two, three, four, depending on you know, the column order on the file. If you do select that the file does have headers, when you go to the mapping template, instead of having an index position, it's going to ask you for the column header value to know what field is which. Uh, this fetch source images from an external source or FTP. This uh, ties back into that get source images that I was telling you about. Um, so if we're able to map in the image file name on this get inventory primary, we can then use that get images integration to import those products from the FTP. And then the archive unarchive inventory setting. This one's actually really important. Uh, a lot of, we'll see suppliers out there that depending on how often they update, they may not provide 
a file that contains all the product information. A lot of times they might just provide what a lot of folks call a Delta file is they may only include a product on that file if there was a change in quantity or pricing since the last time that file was generated. So this is very useful because uh, what this setting does is it says, if the product is missing from the file, should we archive it or not? Um, so based on that, that previous example I was giving you, if they only provide products that have had to change and you do have this turned on, uh, a lot of products are probably going to get archived the next time the inventory sync runs because we're not going to see the product on that file. So our system will assume that it has been archived. So that's just something to be aware of um, and configure this setting based on how your supplier provides that file. So if they always provide every product on that file, regardless if it has had a change of inventory or not, um, and then they confirm, yeah, if we do remove a product from this file, consider it discontinued or archived, you can configure this setting based on the, that conversation you have with your source. Then under our advanced settings here, uh, these are just kind of stipulations depending on the type of file that you we may need to play with this a little bit to make sure that, that the file imports. Uh, treat CSV comment lines as data. This is if the uh, CSV file has lines that begin with a pound sign, um, it will be treated as comments and not as data as default. So it prevents any unnecessary data from importing. This is kind of a rare use case, uh, but if you do see it, we do have a solution for that. The Excel sheet index, uh, this is if you're reading off of an Excel file, uh, the sheet index is uh, which sheet in that file we should be reading. Um, so currently when we import XLS files, we can only read one sheet per that file. Um, so when you set this up, um, you do have to determine which sheet on that, that XLS file we should read. Um, and something to note there, uh, kind of funny, the indexes start at zero. So the first sheet would actually be zero, and then the second one would be one and so on. So just something to keep that in mind. Number of rows to skip. Uh, you'll see files sometimes that maybe has some sort of data at the top of the file, maybe a company name, maybe even a logo or something like that, uh, which doesn't have anything to do with the product data. So this just tells us, hey, how many rows should skip before we start reading actual product data information? Um, so this you can tell at the number of rows to skip to actually get to those column headers and start reading that so it doesn't see that data that doesn't pertain to the products and cause any errors there. And quote characters. Uh, so a lot of times with string values in CSV files, they'll be wrapped in quotes. Uh, typically, we can use this as a default auto detect and it works just fine. But if you do see some issues with how product information is be quoting or being displayed, you can work with our support team and determine the right value to use here. Uh, to get that to import properly. Files to extract, this isn't the main file that we're looking at, is a zip file. Um, so if it's gonna be essentially like products.zip um, and the file in there is products.csv, that's the file inside of the zip file that we should be reading from that source. And then here's a delimiter uh, drop down that I was speaking on earlier. Um, auto detect, like I said, normally works great, but if you do see any you know, inconsistencies there, um, it might make sense to manually selecting one of these. Um, it could be you know, comma, tab separated, semicolon, dot, pipe, and carrot. Uh, but if you're using a delimiter that you're not seeing here, um, definitely shoot an email to our support team. And a lot of times we can get that into our development queue uh, to get that other delimiter set up for you. Um, and sometimes we'll see files that have empty lines in them. And we can say here is just if we need to use that, should we stop reading at the first empty line or just ignore it? So just kind of another configuration thing to help out there. Um, and then character encoding. Again, you'll likely reach out to our support team to get help with this if you're having trouble or if you're seeing flex points having trouble importing that file it might have to do with the character encoding of that. So you can help manipulate this uh, to get that data imported. Any questions so far? All right. And the last bit on the, the get inventory primary, 
is going to be the mapping of this file. Um, so what we can do, we can take a look at creating a new mapping template. So when you do that, it creates a new default mapping template. And we can click this little pop out button to take a look at it. When you first generate it, it's going to generate a, a default mapping template based on what we consider our standard uh, column headers. Uh, I'd venture to guess that if you are using your own source, those headers probably aren't going to match exactly to ours. Um, so I'd recommend coming in here is you know opening up your your CSV file um, on one half of your screen and keeping this open on the other, and just go back and forth copying and pasting the the column header values over here. So whatever the the header value is for parent SKU, paste that in here, brand, category, um, and so on. Uh, things to keep in mind: not every field here is required. Only these ones highlighted in blue. Now. Just because it's not required, uh, there are you know, a lot of values that would make sense to have in here, such as the product cost, so we can control the markups and make sure we're listing products for the proper price on your site. Um, we'd like to have quantity, so that way we can keep track and make sure things are staying in stock. Uh, and something to, to keep in mind here, maybe your supplier doesn't provide a quantity value. Maybe it's just like an in-stock or out-of-stock value. Uh, so what you could do is potentially create a rule here that depending on if it's, you know, maybe they have a value instead of a quantity value, it says in stock, low stock, or out of stock. Um, so you could create a rule here, <clears throat> to hard code a value based on those fields. So if we say, uh, you know, if that column value, let's say it's stock status, equals in stock, We'd say set the quantity to maybe 30. And then if it's low stock, maybe we set it to five and out of stock, we'll set it to zero. So something to keep in mind there that you can, it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one relationship for you know uh, header to value here on the mapping sheet. You can kind of use some of these rules to, to play with the file a little bit and to get it to work how you'd want. Um, if there's any you know particular use case that you're trying to do, um, and you're just getting stuck on it. You're like, I'm not sure how to get that rule set up. Definitely reach out to our support team via email or schedule you know, a 10 or 20 minute call with our support team. And a lot of times we can quickly work with you um, and get that file set up or come up with a rule that would work for your scenario in cases like that. Uh, but definitely you know, do your best at, at mapping this in so that way you can get all the data you need into FlexPoint based on this, this mapping sheet. And once we set that up, you can click save and complete. And that saves all your settings there. And then you can set a schedule by turning this on and have it run every hour. Or if you know, hey, they, they update every week on Monday at 9 a.m. Uh, depending on the schedule, you can set this up so that way we're reading the file um, as soon as they're, they're posting it to the FTP. All right, just got a question here. Best way to handle import of the file reading of data UPC that has leading zeros in the CSV file. Uh, so I'm assuming in this case, the leading zero um, is pushing it into an invalid UPC that is an extraneous leading zero. So what we could do in a case like that is it would be a rule on the mapping template. So we go to the mapping template and go to our UPC field. <clears throat> we'll create a rule here to remove leading zero. So we'll do an if then rule here. We can say if column value UPC, and we can do starts with zero. We can so we're going to do an index base replace. So we will do the first 
position. So we're basically saying if the UPC starts with a zero, then we're going to essentially remove that first zero and replace it with nothing. <clears throat> so we're creating a rule here to essentially strip that leading zero. Um, I believe that answers your question. If not, just shoot in a follow up, but this would strip that leading zero for you. And then going over our, our other types of, of source connections here, um, this was going through the FTP. So sometimes, depending on the type of connection we're doing, these settings will change um, along with the type of connection requirements that, that are needed. Um, so just for example, if we go look at Shopify, <clears throat> to connect with the Shopify as a source, um, <clears throat> there are directions in our support documentation on the, the proper way to go about creating the, the private app and getting these keys. But to connect with Shopify, uh, we need the location ID that we're pulling from, the API keys, passwords, and the, uh, the Shopify store name. And then there's also some, some other configuration settings. So all these are going to kind of vary depending on the type of connection that, that you're using. <clears throat> and, and just kind of depending on that, um, there are outlines in all of our support docs for each individual one showing you which uh, what the settings do and how to use them. Um, but mainly, I would say majority of our, our custom integrations here are going to be off of the CSV XLS file type import. And I would say majority of, of sources do have a way to set that up on FTP so we can pull that in as well. Um, so going through the rest of these, um, the SendPOs, that's a, a very similar setup here. Um, again, you know, we can post that to a Shopify or Suval, any of these, these source um, connections here. But if we're doing a CSV over um, an FTP file, uh, actually we'll create a new FTP. Um, so in the SendPO, this is kind of outbound, how we would name the file. You can set a, a date format for the file, and then where on that FTP, uh, which directory on FTP we'll post it to. <clears throat> and then the file format of the, the file that we'd be posting to the FTP. <clears throat> and then again here, since this is an outbound file, we're trying to, to very likely match a required format from the supplier. If they're requiring us to have headers or not, again, this would come into play on the mapping template, whether it's an index-based position or a header-based position. And we also have the same type of outputs on how we're going to actually create that file for the, the FTP under our advanced settings there. And then we would have a mapping template. So this mapping template would really be on you to create a, a file that matches what the, the supplier is requiring. So on the select hand side, we have all of the available kind of data points and values that could be required of them. Uh, but usually we're gonna see you know, SKU, uh, quantity ordered, the full shipping address for the customer, um, maybe they require you to input a account ID or some sort of ID that they're able to see that this order belongs to you. Um, and then also a, a shipping carrier and method. So all those would be available to be mapped in and you can give them each an individual header name um, that the supplier may require. Um, so you can fill this out, select the different lines here fill out the header names and add as many columns as you as you need to complete all that information that is required of the supplier to get those orders over to them. Get shipments, very similar setup here. Um, if it is gonna be FTP again, 
we'll create that connection. What's the file name look like? Where's that file live? And then another mapping template as well. So we need to say from that file that the supplier is posting on the FTP or that they're emailing, uh, what's that column on the file and how should we save that in FlexPoint here? <clears throat> so the main required one here is the PO so we can match the PO number within FlexPoint versus the PO that we submitted to them for fulfillment. So including the PO number on the order, I would say 99% of suppliers do this because that's, that's a requirement for y'all to be able to track that as well. Um, and then any other information they provide on here, such as a ship that day, shipping cost, um, obviously we'd like to see a tracking number so we can get that in and, and send it back to the supplier. Um, <clears throat> so you can map these in based on the file that they'll be providing. And then again, you want to set this on a schedule probably to run, you know, every 30 minutes or every 15 minutes, probably the max there. So that way we're pulling in that tracking file as often as we <clears throat> we're getting it. So we're getting tracking back to your customers as quickly as possible. Um, very similar for invoices as well. A lot of times we'll see invoices as a as an email connection. They'll be emailing a file, um, which is still almost all the setup is the same. Just the connections a little bit different here. Um, so when you choose email on the connection type, we'll be looking at <clears throat> what address email address should be looking at for the from field, um, <clears throat> the host and protocol. If you're using Gmail as the the host for your email, these will all stay the same. Um, and then the user and password to be able to log into that. And then you can set some, some values here to say, only look at emails that were created in the last you know, five days or seven days with the idea being that we're not having to parse through you know, years of emails for you that if we check you know, all emails in the last seven days, we should be getting all the, the invoices or recently read files that have been sent to that email. Any questions so far on these, these types of integrations or anything in particular that you'd like to look at more in depth here? And then the other one I wanted to take a look at again is the Git Inventory Secondary. Um, so like I said, this is useful if the source has a one large product data file that doesn't get updated as often and they have a secondary file uh, with SKU and pricing and quantity that get, gets updated a lot more often than that main data file. Um, so I wanted to show here the difference on those, those mapping sheets. On the Git inventory secondary, there's a lot more limited information that we can map in here because the idea is this is just used for updating pricing or quantity for the items. So we have our, our cost field, ship fee we can map in, <clears throat> map, MSRP, quantity, shipping cost, and a, a potentially like recommended list price um, that we can map in, uh, opposed to a <clears throat> get inventory primary has all the data fields available here. His idea is this is the, the heavy lift one, and then the, the lighter update coming from the, the get inventory secondary. All right, that's uh all I really had to go through so far, so far on the, the sources, uh, was there any questions on any of that or anything in particular anyone would like clarification on or have more questions on? Just feel free to post it in the chat. Um, okay, follow up on the, the UPC question just came in. Um, specific issue is CSV file loses the leading zero when converting XLS format to CSV. Example, U UPC number is 0089. This is the legit UPC code. Excel lops off the leading zero, showing the number in the cell. Gotcha. So let's take a look here. There are a few ways to go about this.
So we could evaluate the UPC field. Um, the UPCs are typically 12 characters. Uh, so we can do if the, so we're stripping off, so it would be less than 12 characters, right? <clears throat> so what we can say here is when looking at I should treat this as a string for what we need to do. Um, so looking at the UPC value on the file, if the number of characters um, is less than 12, we can prefix that. I'm not seeing a rule I would need to do that. Maybe I set this wrong. Let me give this one more shot. So we're still uh, evaluating the number of characters in the UPC. So what we can do is we can prefix it with zero here. Um, but what we'd like to do is maybe instead of saying less than 12, but we see that UPC equals 11 characters, we know to prefix the value with a single zero. Then we can stack another rule for a secondary one. If the number of characters equals 10, then we prefix the value with a double zero. Um, so that would be a way to <clears throat> modify the import of this view if the XLS file, uh, like in this, this question here, is lopping off the first two zeros or cutting off those two values. This is a way to, to prefix that zero back into the, the UPC to have a valid UPC. Does that make sense? Also on the secondary source import, it only updates the data attributes change and leaves the other attributes alone. Uh, correct, yeah. So um, depending on, on what fields are mapped on that file, those are gonna be read every time on that secondary file. So say your Maybe it's your, your main product data file um, has the same field that's on that secondary field or that get inventory secondary. Maybe there is a quantity field on that primary file and a quantity field on the secondary file. In a case like that, you would want to not map the quantity field um, from that primary source file and just let it run from the secondary source, uh, get inventory secondary. So that way there's no competing condition there because what does get read from the, the secondary file or even the primary file, whichever was the most recently read, that is the data point that's gonna persist. So on any of those, those fields that exist on both the get inventory primary and the get inventory secondary, I would suggest not mapping it on the less frequently updated file and mapping it uh, specifically on the more frequently updated file, which would be the secondary, the get inventory secondary. Um, specifically for you know any of the map, MSRP, um, price and quantity fields, essentially. You do have to map SKU on both. That's not a value that changes. We use SKU to essentially link those two items from those two different files and make sure we're updating the, the proper data there. All right, so we're, we're just about about time here. Um, if anyone has any, any last minute questions, uh, get them in and we can knock those out. Um, otherwise, uh, 
we will post this uh, webinar up on the YouTube channel. I know there's a lot of requests last week on when we'll uh, be posting that up. Um, so typically within a day or so, we'll have it up on our YouTube channel. We'll also be hosting it on our, our webinars page that's on our FlexPoint main website. Um, so definitely check that out. That web page is going to have the kind of the, the upcoming next webinars. Um, so you can see the topics, see if it's anything that you're interested in and be able to register register for that uh, for the upcoming meeting there. All right. So it looks like uh, no more questions are rolling in. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining. I hope this uh, helped clarify a few things or maybe helped you out as you're setting up new sources or had any questions yourself on how to use that. Um, again, feel free to email our support team at support at flexpoint.com if you have any specific questions or need any additional help. Um, you can also schedule support calls, a 10 or 25 minute support call with our support team uh, to get some more hands-on uh, help and answers for you. Hope everyone has a great rest of your day. And hopefully we'll see you next week for the next webinar. Thanks.